Hello guys, welcome back to Board Draw and today we are continuing our season preview of the 23-24 Premier League season. It's coming up quick, it's coming fast, why are you coming fast? Today we're doing the you other like boys. like our new mic caps? Come on, all the gear and no idea. No Come idea out. is correct. And a team who may also have no idea about what they're doing is uh, the red side of Manchester. We covered their blue successful treble winning counterparts last week. Or no, it wasn't last week. Last it was, episode. It was yesterday. Last episode, baby. Last episode. And yeah, we're going to be talking about Manchester United, Ten Hogs, Red Devil Army, whatever you like to call them. Yeah, one year into the Ten Hag project. Should, Should we, we talk about it? Yeah, let's talk about how they did last season. Let's talk about it. Year one under Eric Ten Hag, the bald man from the managers in Manchester. We've heard that story before. Yeah, I mean, maybe they're just following the trajectory of bald managers having success in the Premier League. Can you imagine Big Sam if he was bald? Arteta's got a lovely head of hair, is all I'm saying. Yeah, but how many Premier Leagues has he won? That's true. He's spitting. Ten Hag has been in charge for a year and it was a rocky start for him, if I recall correctly. It was quite a slow start to the Premier League. They didn't really... Back-to-back L's from Brentford and Brighton. And it, they, were, they, were, yeah. they were big, big, big L's. Um, and then, yeah, he got his first win against um, Liverpool. He did. That was uh, one of the questions on our big fat quiz of the year. If you haven't seen that episode, check it out. It's a banger. One of our favourite episodes. But one of the questions we asked was... Ten Hag had a rocky start to his time at Manchester. Who was his first dub against? It was against Liverpool, which everybody found strange. Strange. Cause... But then you look at the, how the season finished, and it's not so strange. Perhaps. But yeah, so uh, everyone's expected Ten Hag to come in and do big things pretty much straight away after his uh, time at Ajax, mm. in which he saw pretty pretty decent uh, levels of success in the Champions League and in their um, National League. But um, for me, you could see what he was trying to implement from the start. You could see what he was trying to do. He wanted to do replicate what he had in his Ajax team, where mm. it was play out from the back, play through the thirds, and build up like solid foundation in each part. Mm. And then you've got sort of a really fluid attacking uh, front three, and you've got legs in your midfield. Mm. He came into a Man United team which had almost none of it. Couldn't play out from the back. Had no legs. The, the front three, front was, three was fluid but just terrible. Yeah, you had you literally only had it was fluidly terrible. You had one major asset in Marcus Rashford mm. and the rest of it you're thinking, mm. you've got Rafael Varane, he's a good player. Bought in Lissandro Martinez, which has been a brilliant coup. He was excellent last season for them. Mm. Don't think he's a very popular player, especially with people like Roz after he's tried to break people's legs in the preseason friendly. Like, is there a shitter nickname in football at the moment than The Butcher? <laughs> you know, you that know, is so you know what I mean? wet. So it's like the and it's butcher, like little and it's tiny, tiny cutlery. Tiny <laughs> yeah, Mate, he's a good player. So yeah, he's a good player. But, but just like a bit. the kind of fan fiction around him is just like everybody needs to calm the fuck down. It, what's the thing about him walking through the clock bend with a cleaver? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, mate. Didn't you, didn't you drop? He's yeah, the only he player, the only defender this season to concede like more than four goals in a game twice. He dropped a seven niller. Like, don't. Don't gas him up too much because there's ammunition for other fans. But yeah. I think he is in he this is what style that Eric Ten Hag is trying to push forward with his main night team. He is that guy. He's got that passing IQ, that kind of on, ball, on the ball composure. And he's got that kind of hungry mentality, that winner's mentality, which is one thing that I think has gone under the radar um, as Eric Ten Hag's kind of evolved this main night team. He's kind of figured out who in this squad is about it, who is hungry and wants to win. And kind of the players that are kind of like, eh, I'm just here for the ride, really. And he's kind of sussed that out in that one year. And this summer, you can kind of see they've gone a bit hard, which we'll talk about in a minute, but they've gone a bit hard in positions where they need to They need to be open. He, he's very much kind of this mentality monster manager. And I like that. I don't like Man United, but I like, like Ten Hag. what Ten Hag yeah. is building. No, I agree with you 100%. I think... His issue, obviously, from day dot was he came in and he had a massive job on his hands. He had Ronaldo was still there. That's one thing we didn't even talk about. Ronaldo. The mentality monster to kick out arguably one of the best players ever to play the game. Yeah, well, yeah. You know. So, like, you love that. 
if you're a player uh, or like a fan, you're a little bit like, oh, he's our Hall of Famer. He's our legend. He's literally how can a, this manager like, that's been here a week say well, this? Depending on who you are, the greatest player of all time. Exactly. And you can, you're can you probably thinking, how's this manager that's only been here a couple of months mugging off our greatest ever player? But you saw it paid dividends. It gave the front three the ability to be fluid. It kind of let the changing room know that this guy is not a fucking idiot. He will... He'll make the he'll decision. He'll shut down any muggery quick. And he also had another tough decision on his hands. It, it probably wasn't tough from the outlook, but a tough decision to make internally because he had to make a decision to keep Harry Maguire on as captain or withdraw the captaincy from him. Um, Gone. Yeah, right decision. But, but he's given it to Bruno Fernandes. Well, fine. So, Tran, yeah, no. What do you think about that? I didn't know where to put this section-wise, but Bruno Fernandes is your captain moving into the new season? Yeah, I don't. I mean, to, for me, it is. Reeks? Maybe who do you give it to, though? You but give yeah, it to, you I give don't it to think... Varane, maybe? Yeah, maybe. But Varane's Varane. not playing every game. Mm. Bruno's going to play every game. Do you give it to Marcus Rashford? I don't really like forward line players having no. a captaincy. You can't see the whole pitch. No. You know? I don't think he's got that kind of leadership vibe about him. I mean, I, I, I think uh, he could because he leads by example, doesn't he? But he's not He's not the vocal. He's not the vocal. Yeah, you need a pitch. vocal man. I mean, I think Bruno is, from what I see as Man United play, is the most vocal. But it's not always in a good way. No, a lot he, of it to me looks ro- moany, moany and ratty. Which yeah. I don't know if you want that in a, man, uh, in a, in a captain. Mm-hmm. But one of the turning points last season, though, was bringing in someone who has leadership qualities in abundance, and uh, that was Casemiro. Casemiro was a uh, revelation. Cash money, Casemiro. Yeah, he absolutely turned their fortunes around that season, and that's probably the reason they got a top four finish. He was incredible, and he played like he missed like eight games or something. Yeah. I but think... you could tell it, the difference between the team with him and without him was night oh, and yeah, day. Oh, yeah, night and day, yeah. 100%. And we saw Marcus Rashford go on like a really hot streak. It's, it started to fizzle out towards the end of the season. But we know what he can do. And if he gets the right players around him, I mean, for God's sake, he was playing with bloody Val Veghorst up front. For God's sake, it was it's just... <laughs> Val Veghorst? Bring that back. But yeah, no, it was... Val Veghorst! <laughs> yeah, it, it's not ideal. Nah. Let's talk about who they're going to bring in this summer to facilitate pushing Manchester City, their blue rivals, for the title. Come on. So, Man United fans have this kind of massive stiffy for whenever someone brings up, like, um, transfer spend, they always go, oh, our owners never let us spend any money. Rah, rah, rah. Bring out the, the green and yellow scarves. Rah, rah, rah. <laughs> when these motherfuckers are spending like 300 million every window. And this, win- this window is absolutely no different. So we'll run you through their transfers in a sec. But once their next transfer, who we'll talk about in a sec, Hoshland, goes through, I saw a stat that May United under Ten Hag will have already spent more yeah. than Jurgen Klopp spent in his entire Liverpool career. Which yeah, is it wild. Is nuts. It is nuts. That's wild. For me, so we said this in the, the previous segment, they needed, they had uh, positions on the pitch where they needed to compl- a complete overhaul. Yep. Number one was the goalkeeper, David De Gea. Yes. From day dot, you could tell that he was unable to play out from the back in the system that Ten Hag wanted him to. Ten Hag actually had to adopt his system because he had no other options but to play De Gea. Mm. He had to adopt his system to sort of uh, start the play higher up the pitch. Yeah. Basically, cancelling out any chance of playing out the back with your back four. Mm. And uh, the build-up starts with either Casemiro or Lissandro Martin or Lissandro Martinez yeah. pushing up. So, they've overhauled David De Gea. Bye-bye. You know what's mad? We started this podcast and two goalkeepers that we were on immediately were Lloris and De Gea. One season of this podcast and what's happened? Both of them being shipped out by their clubs after clocking it. They're actually both dog shite. So they were good keepers but but time moves time stands still for no man. Who's Bordraw coming for next? That's not done below. Goalkeepers sleep with one eye open. Um, I'm talking to you Aaron Ramsdale. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking, love my guy. Um, but yeah, so they've uh, obviously bought in Andre Onana from uh, AC Milan. Inter Milan. Sorry, Inter Milan, yes. For £45 million. Pound. For me, I think that's value. For me... It's about right. I think that's value. No, I agree. I think he is one of the best in the world at playing out from the back. He's he's a bit mental with it, though. He's a little bit like loosey-goosey, but we can allow that because sometimes... 
it, that's when it, you like loosely goes to that last second and that passing lane opens and you go straight through. You bring out, you can take out a player, or... yeah, and some. And um, so, yeah, I think he's about top three playing out from back in the world. Shot stopping, I think he's decent, but like, he's probably, not like he's probably, Allison level. Maybe, or... maybe uh, on par with De Gea. Yeah, yeah, I think he's not he's as good really... as De Gea was. De Gea in yeah, prime. Yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah, shot stopping. Can, you can get away with it though because exactly Man, Man United are a team who don't concede many shots on goal mm. compared to uh, he's not, it's not like he's playing for like uh, I don't know like Sheffield United where he's going to be conceding shots on goal shots on goal yeah he, he's, his team's going to be in charge so you, you can trans, you can sort of trade off mm. the shot stopping ability for the important part which is playing out for the back yeah spin and so yeah, yeah he's one of the best in the world at that so I think that's a really good signing in this day and age as well like to get a top tier goalkeeper for 40 to 50 mil, I think is about what you expect. Yeah, agreed. And I think that they sort of thrown those prices around for David Raya and Roberto Sanchez from Brighton. So yeah, to yeah, get yeah. Onana, I think you've done really well there. Yeah, agreed. And he's vocal. He's a proper leader on the pitch. We saw it in the preseason friendly against Dortmund. He's already been out there shouting at Harry Maguire. Yes. Um, so yeah, he's not he's not afraid to get stuck in. And I think that's what Ten Hag likes, mentality monsters. Exactly that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's definitely a vocal guy. He's definitely a guy that wants to win. And yeah, I think he's their best signing of the three that we're going to go through, in my Definitely opinion. Definitely value for money. And yeah, that is one thing I want to talk about, is that they've made three signings and spent like near enough 200 mil. I think they've been... They're, they're, I've seen a lot of Man United fans on the timeline saying, oh, like, X club demanded this, we paid this, we're so good at getting a great deal. No, not at all. This was an all right deal, the Onana deal. Next, we'll talk about Mason Mount. One year left on his contract at a stalemate with his club about signing a new contract. So, yeah. Should be a little bit of a discount going there. To pay, what was it, 60 60 million million for a player with one year left on his contract? I know there's English tax. I know there's rival tax. I know there's the fact that he is actually a really good player and he's probably worth about 60 mil. But... One you year. have you had everything was in your favor. You had all the leverage. I don't know how you managed to pay so much for him. So, for me, we I'm going to keep harkening back to this point where they had key positions they needed to to purchase a player for. Yeah. Out of all three positions, goalkeeper, striker, and, and an extra midfielder, midfielder for me was the lowest on their yes. priority list. Same. They needed a goalkeeper. I think that was they probably could have got away with the hair for another year. Yeah. But striker for me was number one priority. Need a striker. Goalkeeper was mine, but I agree. I think if you're going to do two positions, it's those two. Yeah, I, well, I think you could get away with like a, like a mid-tier goalkeeper. Mm. But if you get an elite striker in, you're fine. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a minute, though. We both agree unanimously here, all two of us, that this is not the position they should be splashing the cash on. No. And they haven't splashed the cash, but, but have they overpaid? That is the real question here. Mason Mount, we know what he can do, Quality but man. his last few seasons have been a bit ropey he hasn't broke double digits I don't think for a long time maybe he's had one season where he broke double digit goals and assists yeah that was the one where they won the Champions League I think. so it, it can work we've seen it work before but they've got a player in the mould who can who can contribute the assists and the goals in Bruno Fernandes yeah but we like we we are money mace we're not fans but we we see we, we see we appreciate we appreciate him because yeah. he does things that other players in his position can't do. Mm. He unlocks defences in a way that a lot of teams can't. So he is an asset. Yeah. I struggle to find, like, to see a way that they fit him, Casemiro, maybe Ericsson, Bruno yeah. into the same team. I feel like you're going to be asking a lot yeah. of Casemiro. Yeah, I, that's my problem with the Mason Mount signing is that I think they should have gone for someone equal level, equal price, but a bit more defensively savvy. I think you could have got like Kimmich for that. Kimmich, like Barella. Barella I think yeah. 60 mil you get Barella. Um, yeah. I'll, who is it? Milinkovic Savic went to Saudi for 40 mil. Yeah, agree. You get Milinkovic Savic for that money. I think Mason Mount, one year left on his contract, for his attacking qualities, you're paying too much. You need someone that is attacking and defensively savvy. I was going to say Saicedo, but obviously that's way out of the price range. But someone in that Saicedo mold, like a Barella, like someone that can get up and down the pitch quite well. And Mount can do that, but he doesn't chip in with a defensive work. Yeah. And so you're going to be asking a lot of um, 
Ka- uh, Kashmiro. Yeah. And he, Kashmiro, we've seen last season, he's not going to be there for every game. Kashmiro, my fucking so, getting old as so well. He's then, like 35. Where'd you fall? I pulled that out of my ass. He might not be 35. Where'd you fall? But, uh, but yeah. Mason Mount isn't England international. He's a quality player. But it's going to take a bit to get the best out of him. I think, yeah. But Ten Hag can do that. Oh, yeah. I like the idea of him under Ten Hag. We, we said... Got, we, we talked about the English link-up. Yeah. So you've got like Rashford on the left. Mason Mount sort of in that like left eight maybe. Yeah. And then you've got Luke Shaw, maybe James left Sancho. centre back. Yeah, yeah. Jaden Sancho out on the right. Yeah. So yeah, you can... Yeah, it's nice. When Graham Potter signed for Chelsea, I thought him under Potter would be good. And this is kind of similar to that. I think we said this a while ago on the podcast. Mason Mount is that kind of player that does well when he gets a lot of instructions. He, he, he can't be left to his own devices. Nah, and I think Ten Hag will just flood him with instructions. And Mason Mount will... Once he knows his position and his those role, he, yeah. to a T. So I think it is a good signing. But on a base level, I think... He will play so shit. well in a, in, a, in a team which rely on structure and their tactical setup rather than individual play or mm. like football IQ. Yeah. Thanks. But yeah. The final piece of the puzzle for Man United this summer was a striker. And for me, that's where all their money should have been. Um, they pretty much have all but announced the signing of uh, Rasmus Hoysland. For £64 million ad- on fixed levels and then £8 million on add-ons. So we're looking at a potential 72 73. Million. Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be, for me, I think you might, you, you should have just stumped up the extra 15, 20 mil. And got Hurricane. Mate, for me, you've been shagged. This Don, yes. I he, think he looks good. He is a future monster. Is he though? Because how many future monsters do we have? What do you mean? Like how many future... Like there's so many players that look good. I think in, current in monsters, team. you've got Erling Haaland in that forward um, category. Future monsters, you've got Evan Ferguson. Alexander Ishak. Rashmish Holland. I don't know that. He's acts like 25. He's not a future monster. He's... I think he is a bit of a future monster. Nah, nah, nah. We're talking like young though. Like, is he not that young? You've got to be young to be a future monster. I'm talking like 20 year olds that have got like the future ahead of them. Oh. oh. 23. Yeah, fucking past it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but nah, Rashmus Holland and Evan Ferguson, I think, are like the kind of two next up after Haaland in terms of big strikers that are going to fuck up the scene. Interesting. But, the guy got nine Serie A goals last season. Yeah, I saw a piece from Tifo, John McKenzie did a pretty good piece about sort of what Hodgson can bring. And, what stood out to me was his expected goals per shot was quite high. Like, he really only took shots on when he had a high chance of scoring. Mm. Um and sort of, you, if you took his goals per game and multiplied it by however many games he, he missed, he would have ended up about around eight goals behind Osman. Mm. So, there is a player there. The problem is, though, I think Man United need finished articles now. Mate, I think, you, yeah, exactly that. Like, you could pay for Hojland, but you can't make him your only sign-in when, like, the, the project is pretty short-term at Man United. Like, you had this long-term project going... And then you had, like, you had Mourinho in. Yeah. You had Solskjaer in. But, yeah, to, but, to correlate with players like, like Mount, who you've just signed, 25 years old. Anana, 27 years old. Casemiro is 30-something. Marcus Rashford is in his prime right now, like 26, 27 years old. You've got Varane, who's like 29 years old. You're all in your prime. So you can't sign a 20-year-old and expect him to be cooking at the level immediately. Whereas, like, if you've got Harry Kane right now, he's in his prime. He's going to hit the ground running. You, you, you as a squad, this season, next season, you're cooking. Whereas now you've got players that are cooking in, like, three years' time. You've got players that are on their last legs in Casemiro. You've got players that are, like, at their prime now in um, Rashford and Mason Mount. So you've got, like, a bit of a jumble in terms of age. And you that's can, fine. You can, you can argue, though, on the, on the other side, if they had a team full of young players, you'd say they need more experience. Yeah, 100%. So, but I think he is, if you want, like you were saying, that you've got one key position to make it, put your money on. You don't put a kid, and he is a kid, you don't put a kid in that position. You buy the finished article. It could turn out to uh, be an absolute bargain, though. We'll find out. Should we talk about how they're going to line up on their first game of the season against Wolverhampton Wanderers? <laughs> So we're looking at a pretty similar lineup to uh, what finished 
last season, we saw the implementation of how Ten Hag wanted to play uh, in, in pretty much for the entire season. That 4-3-3, three, three, mm. sort of the two eights, maybe Bruno a little bit more advanced. Um, but yeah, we're going to see Lanana definitely starting goal. That's a no-brainer. Wan-Bissaka had a nice resurgence towards the end of the season. Love to see it because he's, he's a good player. His forward game needs work. Yeah. yeah. But defensively, one of the best in the world. Yeah. Um, I don't and, like yeah. him and Anthony as a right-hand side. No. That's a it lacks directness. That, that's a topic for another time. But but yeah, Varane, Martinez, that's a good centre-back pairing. Yep. Don't mind that at all. And then Luke Shaw, I thought he had a good season last season. Yeah, like Luke Shaw and Rashford as one side is just... Infinitely Levels, yeah. better than Wambazak and Anthony, but that's a like I said. We're, we're going to see uh, Casemiro as the holding number six with Mount on the left hand side of him, probably a little bit less advanced than Bruno Fernandez on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. We could probably see this transition to a four-two-three-one out of position, sort of tighter down the channels a little bit. But in possession, it'll definitely be a free-flowing four-three-three, uh, three. and then you're going to be having uh, probably Anthony starting out on the right hand side. I don't know who's going to sort of challenge him from that spot. Maybe we might see Sancho out on the right. Now, have they got so Amad it, Diallo came back? Amad Diallo, yeah, he had a really good season at Sunderland. I don't know if he's going to get reloaned out or like um, like there or Plestri. Plestri, yeah, yeah. Plestri's obviously got a lot of hype around him, but we didn't see too <coughs> too much. Yeah, uh, and then yeah, obviously Rashford out on the left, and then we'll be seeing Rashford Hoyland probably starting up top for them. What if that signing does go through, which we are very sure it will do. Yeah, but let us know down below, Man United fans, are you happy? If you're not a Man United fan. Do they need to do more this uh, transfer window before it shuts? Rank their three signings, their three major signings. Onana, Mason Mount and Rasmus Holland in terms of price, in terms of what they needed and in terms of like how good you think they are. And let us know, so should they it. have gone all out for Harry Kane? Yes. Will it come to bite them in the buttocks? Yes. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I've been bored. Draw. Remember, if you liked our content, remember to hit that subscribe button. It means a lot to us and we're going to be here with you all the way to the beginning of the season. And all the way through. Um, and yeah, let us know. Do you like our mic covers? Yeah, come on. Yeah, come on. Big Shout out air, air audio foam donnies. Love that from them. But yeah, thank you very much for watching, guys. Hit that uh, like button as well. And let us know down below. It's been Board Draw. And it's live. <laughs>